What's up, guys? This is Pedro from My Stuttering Life, where you will hear the good, the bad, the very ugly. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. But through it all, just know that you are not alone. So let's get started. This is episode number 84, and my special guest is Tim Mackesy. Tim Mackesy had a severe stuttering problem into his mid-20s. He has been in SLP since 1992. He is a board-certified specialist in fluency disorders with a private practice in Atlanta, Georgia. Tim has taught the graduate-level fluency disorders program at Georgia State University. He provides a unique and leading holistic therapy model that incorporates CBT and best practices in traditional speech therapy. I am honored to have him as a guest with me on the My Stuttering Life podcast. Welcome, Tim Mackesy. Hi, Pedro. Welcome, sir. Um, thank you for for being a guest on this podcast. We have a, a, a lot of topics to cover, so let's get started. Terrific. Thank you, sir. So do you remember when you first began to stutter? Vividly. In second grade, we were planting seeds in little cups in class, and apparently I stuttered. I was taken to the hallway outside my room in privacy. The teacher looked down and declared, you stutter. I didn't know what the word was, but even at age, in second grade, about age seven, I knew it had to be serious. And I asked my parents, did I stutter before then? And they said no. And that year, the teacher with great intentions made me her project, talking more than anyone else, being at the blackboard and talking, reading. She had great intentions that I can talk about as we go on. Wow. Does it run in your family? Are there are there others that that have a stutter in your in your family? Yes. On my dad's side of the family, I had two uncles who stutter. My last name is extraordinarily rare. There are not very many of us with the last name. And so if you do mathematics, a high percentage of males in my family stutter. Did they grow out of it or do or did th- did they hold on to it? They dealt with it pretty well all the way through their lifespan. During school, did you ever have a speech therapy? And if and if so, was it helpful? I had five consecutive years of speech therapy starting in second grade after that happened. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, if, if my math is right there. And in a net sum, it was not helpful. I would go to a little speech room at school. And in the speech room, I would look at pictures, describe them, play little games, and I didn't stutter. And my last day of speech therapy went like this. I went into speech therapy, and I was somebody that held my feelings very close to my chest. And I dumped, I said, hey, tomorrow I have to talk in front of the class. I'm really scared I'm going to stutter. Because I was getting teased and bullied outside of the speech room, and no one really had a grasp of what was going on. And I did, oh, the person said, Say five words, take a breath. Say five words, take a breath. You won't stutter. You'll do great. See you later. And the next day I went in that class. I stuttered severely and a bunch of kids started laughing. So I removed myself from speech therapy. I went home to my mom and dad. I said, that's it. I'm done. And they would come back to me a year later, two years later, whatever, They would gently come back and say, do you want to try someone else? Do you want to try someone else? And I was defensive. I was like, no, no one understands stuttering. No one can help me. We've been through this. At the same time, I was struggling. All of those grades through middle school, high school, and college were very difficult. And later, I can tell you what actually helped me. During your school years, grade school, junior high, and and high school, how did you handle it in high school? Because during 
my grade year, um, grade school years and junior high, it, I mean, it was, it, it was horrible. You know, the, the bullying, the mm-hmm. teasing, beating me up, you know, um, calling me names. But in high school, th- that's when I found a group that welcomed me in. How did you do in high school? High school was very difficult. I, you know, we've all heard of the fight or flight response. I did my best to hide my stuttering, even though everyone that knew me knew I stuttered. I didn't raise my hand, didn't participate. I would, if they went around the room to take turns reading, I had to go to the bathroom, you know, every day. And there was some teasing and bullying. I did, it was, I was the covert stutterer, the classic textbook. I remember playing golf as a kid. We belonged to a club, which was a blessing. And all I had to do was make a phone call and I could call the pro shop and get my name on the list and bike over to the golf club and play. But I was terrified of the phone. So I would bike all the way to the golf course and then put my name in and then wait and then play with people I didn't know or I, or I, or I would play alone. And so the extents that I extent I went to, to not talk. But now in 28 years of doing the work I'm doing, I've met many Tims, boys and girls who have covert stuttering like I did. And if you go back to my early speech therapy, what was missing is they were just working on things like light contacts and easy onsets. But the reality of my day was teasing, bullying, and fear. So high school was very hard. See, uh, 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 um, our our backgrounds are are similar because in in listening to you describe your school years, you had mentioned the bathroom. <laughs> and l- Tim. <laughs> I lived in the bathroom, Tim, all through school because whenever we would have to read out loud, and it was quite often. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, they would line us up one by one, and the uh, kid before me, I knew that. I mean, I can you know, um, I did it one time, and it was horrendous. They called me Porky Pig, and they mm. and they pointed, and they laughed. And, um, mm-hmm. and, so, um, and so I told myself, this will never happen again. And so I would raise my hand mm-hmm. and go to the restroom and, you know, and just hang out in the stalls. I mean, I did that <laughs> all through grade school, all through junior high. I did it in high school. I did it in college. Mm. I mean, job-wise, I did it at at work because I picked a job field that I could do, which was mm-hmm. data entry. Cause you know, mm-hmm. uh, um, I love computers and whatnot. And when the front desk person had to go on break or go on lunch, they would call over the PAs to have a person go handle the phones. I would run to that restroom and just hang out in the stall for you know break time 15 mm-hmm. minutes mm-hmm. or during their l- lunch time 30 minutes and i mean it's j- i mean you mm-hmm. bring up the f- the fear factor mm-hmm. i mean it it had it had complete control mm-hmm. over my life for th- for you know 35 years mm-hmm. 35 years tim that is a long time I believe you. And unfortunately, you were running to the bathroom pre-smartphone. You didn't have anything to do in there except <laughs> except stare at the walls, right? You and are so correct, Tim. <laughs> and there wasn't juuling and vaping and all those exciting things that kids have now. But um, yes, sir. So if I understand correctly, you had one traumatic event that really, after that traumatic event, you said, it's not happening again. I will hide right. in that bathroom mm-hmm. to prevent the possibility of having to stutter in front of that class again. Right. Then, and then on top of that, 
Tim, I would always miss the first two two days of school because, as you know, mm-hmm. you you have to get up and give an introduction. Right. And so, did that one time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was not pretty, Tim. It was not pretty. Mm-hmm. And then again, I told myself, you know, I will never d- do this. And so all through grade school and junior high and high school and in college, my I'm undergrad and grad school. I always missed the first two days. And then on the third day, I just w- w- waltz right in and just have a seat and do my schoolwork. So did anyone know, did your parents know or anyone know that you're spending that much time in the bathroom? Oh gosh, no, no! It's called s- 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 survival, Tim. Mm-hmm. People who stutter, we are resourceful. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, I did not tell my parents anything when they came mm-hmm. to report cards. L- let me tell you, Tim, I was really good at changing the letter c to an a <laughs> i was good at you know changing the f t- to a b because it's called survival <laughs> wow mm-hmm. yes Ooh, oh my gosh all right so do you have any advice for parents and teachers with regards to children who stutter a lot um at the end, I'll I'll give my my website. I have I have a lot in there for teachers. Um, I mean, to begin, parents should partner with teachers to advocate for the child who stutters. We have to understand maybe the quiet kid in the back of the class who's an easy kid. He's easy. He's never in trouble. But he also is mute. He's selectively mute. He doesn't say anything. That that kid could fall through the cracks. You know, he's like you, Pedro. He's ditching to the bathroom, but no one knew. And when I left the classroom, people didn't put two and two together. Anyways, I, there are accommodations that we can give to kids who stutter. For example, a kid who stutters who has developed anxiety about the stuttering, if that child would like to go first with the book report or read first, we can accommodate that. Um, The Dibble reading tests and tests that are, are standardized, where they make a child say second grade, read this paragraph as fast as you can. And any error which could be an ah, an um, or a stutter is counted against the child. And the child's, they may misdiagnose trouble with reading. If the parent or guardian and the teacher and the the SLP, I, I have to mention that, of course, first and foremost, they're working together, that should never happen. Where a second or third grader with a stutter is forced to read out loud in a standardized test and then is graded down, unfortunately it happens. Now, one thing I feel strongly about is we want to accommodate and work with the kids to face their phobia. I have a problem when people enable children. Enabling is when the child does his book report in the privacy of the lunchroom with only the teacher. Or in Spanish or French, the teacher never calls on Tim. It's all orchestrated. The problem here is Pedro and Tim. Pedro in high school is hiding in the bathroom because of his phobia. Tim going to the bathroom because of a phobia. So think about it. You're a third grader, fifth grader, seventh grader, and well-meaning adults are enabling you. They're, it's short-term thinking. So today, in language arts, Tim might get embarrassed when he stutters. So we're going to let him be excused from it or video it and have 10 tries at it in privacy at home But the other kids are like, wait, I don't want to do it either. Why did Tim? Oh, that's right, because he stutters. 
So enabling is disabling at the end of the day. Every August, I have parents or, or college students reach out to me. They just got on campus and they have a stuttering crisis, an exacerbation of stuttering. The child is freaking out. So Pedro, I, I want you to fill in the blank for me just a quick second. What would make a kid going into college with a stutter, what would make them freak out? Doing an um, introduction, you know, um, reading out loud in class, mm -hmm. you know, m m m meeting new people, doing a group presentation. I mean, mm -hmm. th there are m many, many, many things. Right. Day one, you move in the dorm, you introduce yourself 40 times, you say where you're from, and somebody goes, oh, man, I'm from Atlanta, too. What high school did you go to? And uh, 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 you have a huge block, and then you're off and running. And then the first classes that are small group or foreign language, and you're stuttering. The thing is, I'd like to say you're out of your comfort zone, but it's still a discomfort zone. It's not fair to call it a comfort zone because you brought your phobia of stuttering to college it moved in with you, unfortunately. You had some duffel bags, you had a chest of drawers, and your phobia of stuttering unfortunately traveled with you. And so, you know, it was for me, college was the beginning of college was a nightmare. And again, I mean, here in Atlanta, a lot of colleges here in town, and it's same old, same old. So, in summary, parents really get to know what stuttering is. Stuttering is more than bumpy words and repeating. Stuttering can seep into oral reading. Your child may be holding back. Maybe he wants to be in a play, but he won't. Maybe at Scouts, the child is afraid to talk. Summer camp, he got teased or bullied. Build a rapport, build a trust. Make sure it's safe for your child to tell you what's going on in the world in respect to stuttering. If you're a parent who hyper-corrects your child, slow down, start over, think about what you're going to say, you'll break a rapport, you'll break a trust, and then your child may be reluctant to come to you and share something critically important about bullying because your daughter's afraid that you're going to say, I told you. You have to use your strategies, dot, dot, dot. So there's a real balance in providing treatment for the child who stutters and also building the number one thing, maintain trust and rapport so that your child will confide in you when things are important. That is excellent advice, Tim. I mean, you were bringing up my entire past <laughs> mm. in talking about college group presentations, I would barter. Um, mm. Let me do all of the notes. Let me do the PowerPoint. Let me, mm -hmm. you know, do all of the uh, computer operations if I don't have to speak. And so in college, I, I mean, I did all of the background stuff. That way, when it came time to present, I mean, I didn't have to say a word. I was good to go. <laughs> That's something that a lot of teachers and some parents are unaware is happening in classrooms where maybe I do all the PowerPoints, I research, and I basically put it all together. And then a really glib, free-speaking peer of mine comes sliding in with a silver tongue he gets an A, I get an A, and he's pumped because he didn't do anything. There are people like that, of course. Um, but yeah, and then grading with metrics, you know, this one key thing here is to be able to disclose you stutter, and we're getting better and better that a lot, a lot of our self-help groups are really helping children to disclose. I stutter, okay? And if an eighth grader 
will email the teacher and say, I'm new in your class. I just want you to know I stutter. We have, a, I have to do a talk in a few weeks. I just want you to know that if I hesitate or put some ums in, it's because I stutter. And I noticed on the grading that we could be, we could lose points for hesitating us or ums. So I just want you to know that it's real for me and to disclose. And more and more of my kids I work with anywhere from late, late elementary grade through middle school, through high school, through college are getting better and better at advocating. And the world is getting more aware of stuttering, which dove, dovetails together beautifully. More people advocating, more people understanding stuttering. Um, in, to know that you have rights, the ADA protects people who stutter. So if you stutter in college, you're protected by the ADA. If your child stutters, you're protected as well. So let people know. Because we lose so much, like your story, based upon what I've heard so far, and my story, we're living a life trying to conceal it. And that's a burden that is too big to carry. Go ahead and tell them. See, and you bring up just, I mean, wonderful points, because I was living a double life for approximately 35 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I lived a double life, and, and it reached a point when I turned 40 years old, mm -hmm. I told myself, that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm done. I don't care if you laugh at me when I stutter. I don't mm -hmm. care what is your opinion of me mm -hmm. because pre 40, let me tell you, Tim, I worried about what everyone thought mm -hmm. of me and my stutter. I was a people pleaser like you would not believe. I would go mm -hmm. out of out of my way in the extreme to have people like me and think highly of mm -hmm. of of me. Uh, 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 um and um um as you know Tim, stuttering is draining. Mm -hmm. From the time that I wake up at 5 a.m. Un until the time that I go to bed, at 1030, my entire body is tense. Every organ, every muscle, everything is t is tense all mm -hmm. day long. And when I get home, I mean, I didn't want to talk to nobody. I mm -hmm. didn't. I mean, I wanted to to just be in a dark room mm -hmm. in the quiet mm -hmm. and t and tell myself tomorrow has to be a better day. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, right now, you, right now, are you speaking in the past tense, pre forty, or you still still come home from work all tight and tense? Oh no, sir, pre forty. Because okay. once I turned the big four zero, let me tell you, when I woke up to him, I mean, it was mm -hmm. it 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 was unreal. I woke up and told myself, mm -hmm. "This is it. Good I'm for forty you. years old. I am tired of being afraid. I'm tired mm -hmm. of not being in control." I don't care mm -hmm. if people are laughing at me because I love Pedro. And let me tell you, Tim, w when those words left my mouth, mm -hmm. I, I felt 35 years mm -hmm. of g guilt and shame mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. anguish leave me. It, I mean, it, it was truly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was amazing, Tim. And from that day onward, I did not care. I mean, I love Pedro, and um, st stuttering isn't who I am. It's it's what I have. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, um, I was confident. Mm -hmm. And um, even though I am confident, I still stutter. But mm -hmm. that's okay, because Pedro was awesome. I love Pedro. And those who would mock me and tease me and laugh at me, mm -hmm. I got rid of them. They were not in my s s s circle. Mm -hmm. And once I did that, a whole new world mm -hmm. had opened up to him. It, mm -hmm. it was amazing. And nowadays, <laughs> I mean, I 
focus on being present. I focus on the person having a conversation Mm -hmm. with me. And when I do that, I don't even think about my stutter. And there are times when I don't stutter at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope kids anywhere from, say, 10 through college hear what you just said more than anything I'm going to say today, because you're talking about a couple of key things. One is changing the meaning of stuttering. The word meaning comes from German. It means to hold in mind. What you hold in mind is the meaning that you attach to something. So you and I would wake thinking about, am I going to stutter? How much am I going to stutter? Where am I? Who's going to find out I stutter? Because it's the identity of a stutterer, right? And so the meaning, you woke up at age 40 and you decided to redefine the meaning that you attached to stuttering. You got leverage. It'd be like, let's pretend you drank heavily and on your 40th birthday, you woke up and you said, that's it. I will no longer be a hardcore drinker. I'm going to drink just a little and clean up my life and my need for drinking. So you got leverage. When someone calls me, if they're 25, 30, 35, 40, and they say, hi, I want to address my stuttering. I know that they have a leverage point. Maybe it's a change of careers. All of a sudden they have to talk more, but they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. So you got leverage on yourself at age 40, and I'm thrilled that you did. And I hope that anyone hears what you said, and that is you can make a decision to change your identity instead of everything being about stuttering. Like, I'm a stutterer. That's what people see me as. It allows me to control my choices all day. You know, I was reading about an issue which with a fancy name, pyuresis, which is shy bladder. And if you go to pyuresis.org, last time I was there, like 17 million people have shy bladder. What that means briefly, some of these people plan their eating and drinking all day so that they never have to use a restroom besides their own. So think about this. You wake up in the morning and you fast so that all day long at work, You don't have to use a restroom that's used by others. And then you come home and then you go. If you're at the shopping mall, shopping mall, at the stadium, the food, the food court bathrooms, the hotel lobby, you will not use them. Now, my I figure there's two fears. One is you're going to catch something. This is pre 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 pandemic, Pedro. This is (laughs) yes, sir. (laughs) I'm going to I'm going to catch something. The other thing that I could think of maybe is that someone's going to spy on me. I'm shy and I'm afraid someone's spying on me. There's cameras. I've heard about cameras on the internet or whatever. So it's either fear of infection or fear of people looking at me, I believe would be the two big drivers. So think about this. The person who stutters meets the person with shy bladder. The person with shy bladder says, you know, they confide everything that I just told you. I will only use my bathroom. And the person who stutters is like, whoa, man, for real? And then the person who who stutters says, well, I'm afraid to say my name. They're like, wait, well, yeah, I was was at a meeting last week at a conference for work. And I sat down, I found out we're going to go around the room and say our name. And so I dodged out of the meeting and I came back and I was able to escape it. It was so clever. So the person with shy bladder is like, you're afraid to say your name? But you understand, Pedro, I understand the stuttering can become a phobia, like snakes. And so you woke up at age 40 and said, enough is enough. I'm letting the my concept of stuttering. And it wasn't necessarily shared by people in your environment. They didn't know how much it bothered you. But you attach such a meaning to it that you said, it's like a leech drawing energy from me and I'm done. I'm going to, 
you know, shed this burden, break the shackles, and I'm going to e- em- emancipate myself from stuttering. Good for you, man. Thank you, sir. And so to just p- piggyback, people have no clue what we go through on a daily basis, an hourly basis, a minute by minute basis, mm-hmm. because there were years in my 20s and 30s mm-hmm. that I only uh, uh, communicated through post-its. Wow. Um, and, w- you know, claiming that I lost my voice. And mm-hmm. so I would use post-its everywhere to order food, to ask for help. Mm-hmm. And one time I did it at a banquet, which I never <laughs> – I would tell everyone, please don't hand the teller a note <laughs> at a bank because it will not turn out well. And so, you know, there were just years that, and years and that's years. That's funny. Thank you for that. Yep. <laughs> oh, sir, I have a story about that. But um, there were years mm-hmm. when I would whisper only mm-hmm. because, you know, I don't st- I don't stutter. Mm-hmm when I whisper. And so I would walk up and, you know, tell, you know, tell, tell the person that I had lost my voice. And there were times when, when I had forgotten that, you know, I did it to multiple people at uh, multiple times. And they thought I (laughs) had a vocal damage, you know, disease or something. (laughs) I mean, it, I mean, people don't, realize what we go through Mm -hmm. on you know on a daily basis and so you know that's why we're here we we are here to raise awareness so it you know it's all about education Mm -hmm. i i coined an expression a while back when the attempted solution becomes the problem so running out of the room when it's your turn to read Asking the teacher, can I give my report in privacy so no one hears it? Asking my mom to go up to the soccer table to register for soccer clinic, like walk up to the table, give my name. Asking my friend to order food for me. Um, Like you said, allowing someone to do no work in a project so that you wouldn't have to talk. I, for years and years and years, would never introduce somebody. So let's pretend you're hanging with me, Pedro, and we're buddies. Someone comes up, I know that person, you don't. I would never introduce the two of you. I would act aloof until you guys took took care of it yourselves. I used to point to menus. When the waiter came up, I would point to it, and then they would say it for me. And all I would say is, yeah. And they're like, oh, that's what you want? You want that salmon salad? I thought that was so clever. Now, I was pre-internet, pre-smartphone. The phone was a nightmare. I would drive to a place of business and walk the aisles of a big box store, never actually approaching someone. So I might lose three hours drive to a big box, walk every aisle looking for a product, and go home without it. That is the truth. And on and on, I can go on and on. You've heard the stories. So when the attempted solution is the problem, we do so many things trying to conceal the stutter. My my first podcast, I just, I just jumped into podcasts in April. I was way behind everybody else, but... <laughs> My first podcast is Purpose, Intention, and Stuttering. Oh, wow. How cool. If your intention is to conceal your stutter, dead end. You have to change your purpose, which you did at age 40. Pretty cool. I mean, it is. Um, um, And so, Tim, to hear you talk about being at at a party and so you know the person I don't I've done that too sure and and then you know telephones I mean the telephone it was my nemesis Mm -hmm. until I told myself I am going to have to do this I'm going to have to and so I bought an office telephone off of eBay Mm -hmm. it 
looked just like the one at work. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, um, <laughs> and so <laughs> I got it. Um, I practice every mm-hmm. day f- for months. Mm-hmm. I drew on on my um, drama background, my acting mm-hmm. background. I will. I would pretend to make phone calls Mm -hmm. and have conversations. And then I would pretend to hear the phone ring and have Mm -hmm. a conversation. And um, and so um, I would do that for hours Mm -hmm. every day for about half a year. Mm -hmm. Because after half a year, it became boring. Mm -hmm. Boring. First, I had... Fear, anxiety, everything. But after mm-hmm. doing it every day, I mm-hmm. mean, nonstop. I mean, I did not take a break. I didn't go on vacation. No, I did it every day f- for months. Mm-hmm. And at that point where it became boring, mm-hmm. that's when I said, okay, now I can do it. Mm-hmm. When it came time to a real world application, mm-hmm. like, like at work, when the phone would ring, I just pick it up. Hi, I'm Pedro. How may I help you? Because it became boring. I desensitized myself. No more fear. No Just more. Fear. None of that. And people tell me, oh, practice makes perfect. I said, no, 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 no. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Yes, sir. Um, and so nowadays, oh, I love the phone. Make phone calls. I receive phone calls. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just interesting. Yes, you had to face your phobia. I did. Yes, I mean, whew. and and th- this is hard work, Tim. Mm-hmm. This is extremely hard hard work. We have to work twenty times harder than everybody else. What a you know a a person recording their voicemail. It may take them. Half a minute, one minute. It takes me 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that for us, I mean, we have to practice and breathe and practice and breathe and then do it. So, ooh, interesting. Anyone listening, though, there are also people who have dyslexia and learning challenges, autism um ADHD a lot of different things that only people very close to them have any idea what they deal with every day at school or at work so i do I do want to um acknowledge that there are other people struggling with things that aren't known to others um yes sir. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah did you ever have any Secondary behaviors, like for did I me? ever? <laughs> okay, Tim, hold on. I'm asking the questions. Hold on. <laughs> you know, there were times when I would tap my leg. Mm-hmm. You know, tap my foot. There were times when I would have a British accent. Mm-hmm. There were times. I mean, just uh, you know, that's just me. But I'm asking you, Tim. Did mm-hmm. you have any secondaries? Yes, sir, I did. If there was a drought in your town, you wanted me because I used to (laughs) spit when I stuttered on P's and B's. Um, P's and B's, my head would turn down to one side. I would twist and hit the B and P so hard. There were times when mist would come off of my lips. And there were many times when a friend would say, say it, don't spray it, man. So that was... I mean, I can laugh about my stuttering. I don't laugh about somebody else's. I can laugh at mine now. Right. It was horrible at the time. So those right, are exactly. real, those are plosives, P's and B's. The other plosives at your tongue, like T D K G J, I would look up to the corner, squint my left eye, and just hammer time. Now I was a big eye averter. Eye aversion oh, yes. is when you feel the stutter coming and you look away from your listener. Yes, sir. And that's a massive symptom. It reveals a lot within someone who stutters. 
So those were all, um, oh, and then the phone specifically, I basically didn't use the phone for about a decade. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. again, I was pre-smartphone. If you met a girl in high school, you had to call her home phone <laughs> and mom, dad, or the brother from the football team would answer. My blocks were silent. They would say, hello, hello. And I'd hang up. I'm so dated, bro, that there was not even caller ID. So I would I was a, be able to hang up and no one knew who it was because nothing came out. Right. Coming back to the phone, some people think that the phone is not as critical now anymore. And they're absolutely wrong because with the internet now, people employers want to be super efficient. So a lot of times your first interview is either, you know, you go online and you apply for the job or the internship. The next step is either a chat where they can see you or a phone call or these robo chats, which are annoying. You log on and someone has pre-recorded questions and you answer them. And you never get to interact with a live person. But think about that's really like phone calling. And then I actually had a 13-year-old girl who had a phobia of the phone. She never made phone calls. People made them for her. And this is a true story. Her father was a retired firefighter from New York City, a hero from 911. And unfortunately, the illness he, he contracted after 911, he had to retire. They found the mountains of Georgia, which is a beautiful place. And I started working with her, making phone calls from my office in front of the mirror, which is very potent, going out in public. So here's the true story. They're up in the mountains of Georgia, going down a highway, and a poultry truck was swerving, coming at them, went down a ravine. So the firefighter, the retired firefighter dad, parked his car, ran, he, before he ran down to save this gentleman, he told his daughter, do you see that mile marker right there? Call 911 and, and tell them we're at mile marker 52. He ran down, cut the seatbelt, and pulled the man out of his vehicle. That is when the phone call can be an emergency situation. So phone calling is critical for careers and maybe to save someone's life. So kids who stutter have to learn how to make phone calls. The telephone now, Mm -hmm. you know, has all these vast high tech um, improvements. Back in my day, we had pagers. I don't know um, mm, oh. if you know about page because you are younger than I am. I just turned fi- fi- 50 last week. And so we had pagers. And so, you know, thankfully, everyone had a pager. And so you would put in their number, call me back. And I mean, <laughs> that was a crutch, I know. But I mean, you know, growing up in the late 1970s, mm-hmm. we had r- 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 rotary phones. And so I just remember to, those. <laughs> just to dial, it would give me heart heart mm. palpitations. But but to, you know, p- to um, piggyback on what you were talking about with you know job interviews i can't tell you how many job job interviews i would turn down and mm-hmm. lie t- to the um, hr recruiter when they wanted to do a telephone panel mm-hmm. i would just tell them that you know thank you but i have an, an another job you know which mm-hmm. i mean it was all a huge lie but i mean th- nowadays it is so important that kids learn how to use a phone. It's true. A pager story, and I'm older than you, actually, Pedro. No, you're not. You're 31? 32? (laughs) (laughs) I'm 50. (laughs) Based on what information? (laughs) On the video. (laughs) On your video. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm sorry. Somebody must have hacked it and stuck in like a... (laughs) 
Brad Pitt or something. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> anyways, I had a pager. Now this is a this is a funny story. I came out of graduate school in 1992 as a speech pathologist, right? And going through graduate school was difficult. There's something called clinic where you have to perform, you have to administer tests and parents and supervisors and fellow graduate students and faculty are watching through a two-way mirror. So Pedro, you're going to understand this, dude. A standardized test, you have to read it verbatim. You right. can't change words or put ums. And timing is of the essence because it's standardized. So you're supposed to speak it just like this, just perfectly for the child in front of you. And you're being graded. So when I was in graduate school, I had this idea that when I graduate and have what's called my C's, I can never stutter again, ever. Guess what? That set up, Pedro. An exacerbation oh. of volcano. Exactly. The, the dormant volcano erupted. So I'm walking around with a white lab coat at the hospital with my name, you know, embroidered on there, Tim Akese's speech pathology. And man, the first year was brutal as I, for example, had to walk up to a doctor to talk about a patient. And I felt like his or her eyes were piercing my chest. Speech pathologist, stuttering, they'll hire anybody. What is this, right? Right. I had a belief, a very toxic belief, that if I stuttered, I was a fraud, a professional fraud. And so I relapsed, man. I regressed. I had an exacerbation, whatever technical word you want to call it. I blew a gasket. My stuttering actually went back to like high school stuttering. Horrible. The phone was brutal. And again, standardized tests are part of our, our industry. So I had to come up to the bedside and assess someone who had a stroke and read standardized questions as their loved one was listening. If they were sharing a room, there was other people in the room listening. So I had to confront everything again. But it's wow. I set myself up to fail by thinking I had to be perfect, you see? Right. And pager, this comes back to the pager story. So as I, after I had a full year, I was able to start seeing patients on my own. And so I started to see some people who stutter in the evenings. And I had a pager. And it would go off. I'd look down. I'd go find a phone somewhere and return the call. And I was still having trouble saying my name and my job title. And it might sound like this. Hi, this is Tim Mackesy. I'm a speech path path pathologist. Did you call? And I had two experiences where a well-meaning mother said, Sir, I don't know how to say this to you, but you're stuttering so bad on the phone here that I can't bring my child to you. That, re that really did happen. Oh Twice. my gosh. Twice. And you understand, like I understand, that was like a javelin going through my chest. Oh, of course. Like worst case scenario, someone saying you stutter so bad, you can't see their child. I politely referred them to a peer to make sure that they got on their way. I had to lick, lick my wounds and hunker down, which I did, because anything now is easy, whether it's a, a courtroom appearance, a deposition for a lawsuit, a podcast, a phone call, speaking in front of groups. So I've had to face all the things we're talking about. So that's my pager story. I live the pager story. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Ooh, okay, so what is your most effective technique that you do to help you with your speech mm -hmm. well we have to break it into two parts think of a scale an old-fashioned scale with the two plates on one side you have cognitive your thinking your feeling the psychology part of stuttering that we've spent so much time on today the other side is speech mechanics speech motor skills easy onsets fluency 
you know, shaping light contacts, right? So when I meet someone who stutters, I kind of look at them, which side's heavier, the psychology part of stuttering or the pervasive stuttering and blocking that's just so difficult for the person and draws so much attention from the environment. Um, I'm kind of speaking in the past tense now. I I took a deep dive into psychology around the year 1999 and 2000. I was certified in a half a dozen different things. I dropped 20 grand over three years because I still had situational fears, saying my last name and a number of different things that were almost guaranteed to cause me to block. The way I thought and felt about it, I had anchors, they're called, like long standing fears and phobias, shame of stuttering of my name, right? So that's the psychology part that no one learns in graduate school. No speech path gets good work on that in uh, grad school. And I was the first test rat. I did all of it on myself to remove all my fears sound fears, word fears, anything like that, right? And then it sure made things like techniques easier. I used to use a lot of light contacts, easy onsets, and what, what what's called pullouts, right? I'm so chill now, attaching no meaning, fear, shame, and embarrassment to stuttering, that it's easy, there's less burden for me to use any sort of speech techniques, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. I want to give you a quick trial by fire. You told me about your trial by fire. Just before graduate school, I put myself at the front desk of a hotel in downtown Atlanta with 1,200 rooms. This is pre-internet. Wow. I would look at a line of 50 people because they had to check in and check out physically, right? They didn't even have the the in-the-room computer check-in, check-out. Wow. That's how old I am. (laughs) Anyways, here I am. Now, first, I carried bags from cars up to people's rooms as a bell person. And I used to look at the front desk and say, no way can I stand behind that. No way. But one day, like your 40-year-old birthday, your 40th birthday, I said, you know what? I'm going to apply for the front desk, trial by fire, full immersion. So check in, check out. I would answer the phone in front of strangers, pre-internet, check in, check out in person. They didn't even have uh, on the TVs in the room the ability to check in, check out. So it was all done in person. And it was a huge convention hotel, which might turn over all of the rooms in one or two days. It's very, very crazy, trial by fire. So somebody would come up, they would check in, I might get the phone in front of them, I might make a phone call on behalf of a guest if they asked me to, I might have to call housekeeping on behalf of a guest to get more towels, so I was full immersion. Meanwhile, I was also going to Toastmasters twice a week, two different Toastmasters clubs uh, a week. So between the front desk of the hotel and to Toastmasters, that was my special sauce to immerse myself in talking. And that gave me the courage to go back to graduate school for speech pathology. And that's where I am now. How cool. I mean, 1,200 rooms, I mean, that would just put me into cardiac arrest right there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. So here, here is a hot topic. Okay. We have a couple of hot topics, but here's the, here's the first one. So do you let others help you finish your sentences? If I had stutters like I used to that prompted somebody to complete a word for me here in 2020, I would, I would be inclined to say, thank you. I have a stutter. And I would say it in a way so that they didn't feel bad because they have good intentions. At the same time, I would just find a very artful way to say, you know, thanks for helping with the word, but, you know, I, I, I do have a stutter. That way I would give an opportunity to help myself 
as well as the next person down the road that they meet who stutters, they might be inclined to be patient. You know, we do have to understand a lot of people, you know, they're doing it with, with good intentions. And there's three, there's three major per personality groups. You have your high visual, your high auditory, and kinesthetic. Someone who's visual, they talk really quickly, their hands are moving, and they're very visual. And they, they tend to try to summarize what you're saying very quickly, where an auditory person tells a longer-winded story. So a visual person's more inclined to try to summarize what you're saying and finish what you're saying for you. But always out there, if you stutter, advocate for yourself. Tell people you stutter. If anyone's snarky, cut them off. I love to say, I stutter, so what? Or I stutter, grow up, one or the other. Yes, that, that is a great one because, you know, there have been plenty of times when when um, I'm asked my name mm -hmm. and I have, have a long block and mm -hmm. and then they respond um did you forget your name yeah and that's when like you mm -hmm. i shut them down i have a stutter <laughs> well if somebody says what's the matter did you forget your name they likely don't know you authentically stutter right they could think right. that that was just a quirk what they saw so i want to the takedown is the, you know, someone who like laughs at me or mocks me, flat out mocks me like, oh, hi, t -t Tim. <laughs> Guys, did you hear that? Exactly. Yes. That's the person that you take down. I used to take it. <laughs> I, I used to, I was told as a kid, just, just try to ignore them. Just try to ignore them. Right. The thing is, you and I know those accumulate as wounds. Oh, of course. So, yes. you know. People who stutter, what they have to say is just as important as someone who doesn't stutter. And if, you, if you're out there listening and you have not yet adopted a self-advocacy where you speak up for yourself, do it ASAP. Because if you try to ignore bullies and teasing uh, over an extended time period, what's going to happen is you'll be like Pedro and Tim in high school where you edit and you go hide in the bathroom. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So here, here is a head scratcher. Mm -hmm. So wh wh when you are alone, can you speak without stuttering? I always could, even in the darkest days. See, I am the opposite. You know, mm. if I mean, when I wake up and and I go over in my head the day, mm -hmm. you know, all of my appointments, I talk out loud, as we all do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I still stutter. When I'm talking to my dog, Ruby Jean, I still stutter. So, you know, hmm. it's just interesting. We're all different. True. Okay, so here is another hot topic. All right, so dating. It's hard for everybody, mm -hmm. but if you have a stutter, it's like a million times more difficult. How did you handle dating with having a stutter? Very poorly. As I mentioned in high school, you had to call someone's home. And let's pretend there's six people in the house. There's one out of six chances that the girl you like is going to answer. If the girl I liked answered, I'd spit it out. They'd be like, oh, this is Tim. Okay. Um, College was difficult. Again, pre-smartphone, there's no texting. So do you remember when every restaurant and bar had a match, had matches, right? So right. you would, the cool thing was to get matches and write her phone number. It's like, and then, <laughs> and then, and then your friends are like, whoa, wait a minute. You got her number? Oh my. Oh. And then they say, you're going to call her, right? Yeah, I want to call her. And then I would throw it away. Because I was afraid as soon as she finds out I stutter, she's gone. Um, and then they would ask, man, did you did you, you tell me you called her? Uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I was just kind of busy. And uh... so dating was very difficult. Um, but um, I've been married for 26 years. So I figured out dating, huh? <laughs> oh, you 
You had me beat by one year. I've been married for 25 years. So, you know, I'm very competitive, but I'll give you that. Congratulations, man. Thank you, sir. Okay, now, what do you think about all this new technology? You have Google Home. You have Alexa. And then you have the one that starts with an S that I really have a hard time with. Do you think that all this new technology is helpful or hurtful for people who stutter? Well, I wonder if Surrey was named after Tom Cruise's daughter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Ba-dum-bum>. <laughs> yeah. Drop Yeah. Drop dropped the mic. Um, <laughs> that's interesting because people have told me that when they activate those and they stutter, it ta- it takes them on a wild woolly chase not looking for what they want. I've also, with voice to text, you stutter in voice to text and it creates a big, a big mess. Um, so, you know, I, you have to have a semblance of control of your mechanics if you want to execute with Surrey or Alexa and have it understand exactly what it is you're saying. I don't know how well the technicians can program and if if they're if they're listening please do this for folks who stutter that if i go for example mission impossible that you pick up mission impossible right i don't know if there's a way that they can code things to pick up disfluencies but maybe they can work in that direction so that maybe it's more subtle to nuances and that makes me think of people with with a thick accent maybe they move to america and their accents really heavy how do they do voice to text i'm not sure but um the technology other technology you know so many people will text instead of call so i didn't know if you're going to go down that road but sometimes the technology um you know, so so many people say, I got in I got in trouble at work. I tried to text my boss to say I was going to be late. And he said, you should have called. I don't check right. my smartphone at work. So I have to right. be cautious about that. Mm-hmm. And the and the in the ear devices, you, you, you know all about those. That, oh, yes, sir, I do. The DAF, FAF, and every other version, um, they're lacking people who let's pretend you're in sales and you have anxiety and fear about your cold call and you're making phone calls. Those in, I mean, the fluency master came out in, in 89, the speech easy device hit the media around 2001. And now the technology is so inexpensive that you can get an app for your smartphone. You can probably have some sort of a DAF for $50. Right. But remember the psychology part of the scale. If you carry a lot of fear and anxiety, it will overwhelm the auditory signal and your, your ability to use it when you want it the most. There's also a lot of medications being prescribed for people for fear and anxiety of stuttering, but that's a whole nother journey. Oh yes. That's a whole other podcast because I can, sure. <laughs> I can tell you they wanted to put me on Zyprexa, um, put me on some Xanax. And so, Ooh, yeah, that's a whole yeah. other podcast part two, but m- many people who stutter tell me that they use Google home or Alexa to help them practice their speech, which I thought was kind of cool Ooh. because you know, it's, um, it's a machine hmm. and and mm-hmm. n- not a human. So I thought that was interesting. You know, what's better, I believe, because that, that is an auditory recording only, right? Right. What, what is much more potent is getting in front of a mirror. Two-thirds of everything we learn comes in through our eyes all day, right. every day. Visual feedback. Why are mirrors used in ballet, yoga? martial arts, ice skater hand movements, baseball swings, golf swings, and I can go on and on and on. When you watch yourself perform an activity in front of a mirror, you have visual, auditory, and kinesthetic feedback all happening at once. I learned about mirror work at Eastern Washington University from Dorvin Breitenfeld. Dorf, if you're out there, you're a beast making phone calls in front of the mirror, reading in front of the mirror, 
Joe Biden's speech has been in the news, I mean, for 35 years, I followed his speech very closely. And in the last year and a half, it's been all over the news. Joe Biden in People Magazine, 19, or sorry, 2011, right around the time of the King's speech, they did a piece called the VP speech. And Biden says the nuns taught him to read out loud with phrasing, and then they put him in front of the mirror to recite poetry. So a mirror is on steroids compared to just auditory. On, I did a, um, on YouTube, if you search my name, I have a video specific to how to interview online if you stutter. And one of the things I tell people, put a huge mirror behind your webcam, and it looks like you're looking at the webcam. However, you're watching yourself in the mirror. How cool. I mean, th the mirror work, um, I did that for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, practicing my name, practicing greetings, mm -hmm. because G's were especially difficult. Mm -hmm. And so what um, I would do is use a, a, a what um, um, I call a, a, a um, bumper word, you mm. know, hi, good morning. Hey, good morning. Yeah. Um, and so I would practice reading out loud in mm -hmm. front of a mirror, mm -hmm. um, practicing my lines, mm -hmm. you know, f for a play, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, oh, I mean, the mirror it is an awesome tool to help you. And it's underutilized. I can't tell you how many people come into my clinic. Maybe they've had five previous attempts at speech therapy or so, maybe even more. And I'll ask them if they've ever been in front of a mirror and they go, uh, no, why? And it, it's old school, but I'm telling you what, it is incredibly powerful. For me to get over my fear of phone calls, remember I was, I come out in the field Let's pretend a nurse calls and says, hi, this is Pam with David, with, with Dr. Smith's office. We'd like to send you a young child who stutters. Please call. I would get in front of the mirror to make that phone call back to the nurse because it gave me the greatest opportunity to speak the way I wanted to speak. And it worked. Now, How now, cool. now I, I don't need the mirror now for, for those kind of phone right. calls. Right. Wow. Whew. I mean, you you are uh, you are one thousand percent correct. The mirror is under utilized. Oof. Career wise, what led you to become a speech language pathologist? Did you want to? Because um, uh, there are many guests that I've had who have speech impediments and who are now speech la language pathologists um and the re and the re the reasoning for them is that they wanted to be able to help people like mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. because I can't tell you how many times I've had a speech therapist who who did who did who did not have a stutter and and they were not able to comprehend what I was going through. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, there was a gap. Remember, I refused speech therapy after sixth grade through the rest right. of middle school, through high school, through college. When I was a fifth year senior, it took me five years. I dropped classes because of stuttering. My transcript would show any D for drop was connected to, if I found out I had to talk a lot, I would drop it. So my stuttering was extremely expensive because I was putting myself through college. Um, I was about to leave the U University of Wisconsin in Madison for Atlanta, Georgia. And I was in a crisis. I, was, I needed to finally gr grow up and, and get a job. So I went down to the clinic and there was a woman named Florence Philly on faculty. And she's the first person I ever met that could see into the stuttering soul very quickly and understand exactly what was going on with me. I had a chance to work with her a little bit, and then some of her graduate students assisted me just before I moved to Atlanta. And so I moved to Atlanta, 
unemployed, no money. And as I told you, I went to work at the front desk of the hotel. So as I'm rising up in the hotels to management, they actually put me in management, which is kind of cray cray. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I reflected back. I was like, what do I want to do? If you get into management and hotels, you might be working 60 to 70 hours a week because you're salaried. There's no overtime. And I was working Christmas Day, Thanksgiving Day, New Year's. So I was so proud to slay my stutter to get into management. But then there I was hating it. So I actually was on a ride with my father. We were going fishing. I said, you know what? I'm thinking about going back to graduate school for speech pathology. And he listened and asked me questions for about two hours. And I concluded, you know what? I'm going to do it. Wow. And I already told you that opened up a whole new chapter of facing stuttering in graduate school. So absolutely, you've told us about your internal struggles and this is your way to give back. I have my way to give back. Because like you said, if you've never stuttered, you can't comprehend the phobia, the shame of stuttering that so many people have that we both had, Pedro. And right. you're helping, man. You're helping people too. Well, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. What has your stutter taught you? That's a nice question. I wasn't ready for that one. Just just let me stir around a little bit here. <laughs> yes, sir. You are the boss. <laughs> mm. Well, let's come back to when you woke up at age 40, this redefining yourself um, from stutterer to I'm a person who stutters, changing the meaning, changing the shame, embarrassment, taking it head on. Um, and... There are others before us who have done this. When you think of James Earl Jones and many other people, King King George the Sixth, great story from the King's speech, take it hat on. That had to happen. And yeah, man, that whole period of time from working at the front desk of a hotel and Toastmasters, two Toastmasters meetings every week and competing in Toastmasters speech contests, what it taught me is that anything's possible. I was reading about a guy, I think his name is Rob Jones. He came back from Afghanistan. He lost both of his legs. So he has those spring-loaded prosthetic legs. I don't know what you call them, but you've seen them. Right, yes. I think in 2017 or 2018, he ran 31 marathons in 31 days on prosthetic legs. Wow. Can you believe that? Wow. So mm. you can accomplish anything. Our, our cross to bear is stuttering. There are people, I did a podcast a few, like about a month ago with a young man named Jack. Jack had dyslexia. ADHD, dysgraphia, which is trouble writing and stuttering. And he was his valedictorian in his high school. He just got through Rhodes College and now he's, he's applying for law school. The guy's an animal. So whatever your deal is, take it on. Whatever it is, that's what I learned from stuttering. It's a... Um, you have to turn the tables on it. I, I think of it as like playing chess. Like my final years of really having to deal with my stuttering was like playing chess. And when I do therapy with someone, it's kind of like doing chess. Um, how much is psychological? How much is he avoiding? How much could he benefit from saying words beginning with S? And if his name is Sam and he holds his S as you know, so it's like playing chess. So helping people who stutter will never get old. As my dad said, you'll take a phone call from somebody when you're 80 and you'll, and you'll, and you'll help their kid. And I said, yeah, that's right. I will. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How cool. What um, I have learned is my stutter has taught me courage. Um, mm -hmm. It, it has taught me um, empathy and that yes. mm -hmm. we all have a light we all have a, a light 
within us and Mm -hmm. it is so powerful Mm -hmm. and so growing up it was dim Mm -hmm. and during my high school days it was pretty much gone and and that's when you know i went down the path of having um um suicidal ideation Mm. you know to having a plan Mm -hmm. and that one moment in time that's when i found my light Mm. it it went i mean it went from dark Mm -hmm. to light and that's when i knew i i am here for a purpose i have a purpose now i know what my purpose is and when i tapped into that light Mm -hmm. i mean i I kid you not, Tim, I can do anything. It doesn't it. matter. I can do anything. And if I said, oh, well, guess what? Life will go on. The world will mm-hmm. not stop because I cannot say my name. And once I tapped into that light, a whole new world emerged. And mm-hmm. so now, I mean, life is fantastic. I am having the best best time of my life Mm -hmm. i'm 50 now and so i mean i you're still young i'm still young (laughs) we are still young we're still young (laughs) all right you know so so pedro right now it's october 5th of 2020 and we know the nation is still in this pandemic now people who stutter carry a social anxiety and some of them are depressed and you mentioned that what you might have done to yourself and we're really really glad that you're here today still and there's a lot of young people out there, if they're listening, who stutter, who have an extra uh, pile on of pandemic stress. Stay the course. Stay the course. This is going to get better. And if you have extra anxiety because you've lost a lot of social things, maybe you can't go to concerts, the gatherings are restricted. You're doing online classes only. You're not able to. And a lot of people who stutter are telling me they have more trouble online than in person. Anyone out there, stay the course, okay? Um, Just get through this. um, Do some, some, some meditation, exercise, burn it off. See a counselor if you need to. And um, understand things will get better. See, and... And that is an excellent point, because in this pandemic, in this new normal of now we are doing everything via Zoom Mm -hmm. or Skype or Microsoft Teams. Mm -hmm. And this has pushed us completely out of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And so that first time that that I had to create a meeting and start the meeting, Mm -hmm. let me tell you, I was calling on the Lord. Mm -hmm. I did all of my diaphragmatic breathing. Mm -hmm. And what helped me the most Mm -hmm. is is once that camera light turned on, because you can't miss it, once that turned on and once all those 20 people were on the screen and I had to give a presentation and or a training, I told everybody, I'm Pedro, and I have a stutter. Good for you. And and once I did that, whoo, it's go time, Tim. It's go time. I mean, I did everything, was having a, a great time. And if I had a block, I would stop mm-hmm. and breathe yep. and carry on. And carry in, Mar- on. in March and April, a lot of people reached out who were in a pretty good place with their speech before they had to work from home and they had to start doing things like Zoom meetings. And I haven't done very many of those big uh, Zoom rooms or whatever, but I could see, let's pretend there's 12 faces on the screen. And, you know, as soon as I speak, the microphone picks up, it's Tim. And then I appear as a big thumbnail in the middle of the screen. Well, I'm sitting there, and this didn't happen to me, but I heard about it from a lot of people. Let's pretend you have a silent block, and you're trying. Somebody says, who's got the fourth quarter numbers for the company? And I have them, and I'll look like a rock star if I spit them out. 
and I want to go, I have them, but I'm, uh, 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 uh. and maybe then the microphone does pick me up mid stutter and my face is contorting during a speech block and I'm front and center. So I heard a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people stutter do better face to face because you can read their, their language. So for example, I stutter and you're maintaining eye contact and you've picked up I stutter and it's comfortable. I don't feel like I'm being judged. A lot of people have more difficulty in chats or phone only, auditory only without any visual. So it's very interesting how people who stutter were thrust into some new, some new, yeah, some new situations. And then children who stutter, any parents out there, be mindful. Sometimes your children are being asked to upload a video that's going to be seen by everyone, but you don't even know. So your child's around the corner in the kitchen doing a video because they're so savvy. And the outcome, unfortunately, could be significant. Stuttering, he wasn't prepared. You weren't prepared. You didn't even know about it. And then children doing book reports or reports, um, uh, PowerPoints in front of their classroom from my home to their homes. And so really be in touch right now with the speech pathologist if they're active with your kid at school, the teacher, really advocate for the kids because I've also heard stories of children having devastating experiences of logging on and having a lot of blocking. And then if they're in the older grades, the instant messaging begins like, Hey, did, did you see Tim stutter? Whoa, man, I didn't know he stuttered like that. So you have to have a gestalt of right. what a kid who stutters is dealing with. Yes, you are 1,000% correct. And, and let me throw in stuttering behind a mask. Oh, that is, wow. that is a reality right now. Yes, I've it had, is. I've had children go out in public wearing a mask to order something and they're blocking behind the mask and the server or the cashier doesn't know they're stuttering and is repeatedly going, what is that? Did you want a large? Did you want a tall or a vente or a grande? And I've had, I've heard kids start crying and run out of the place of business because they can't see the child's face as the child's g -g 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 going like that. So this is also another twist on things. Yes, the um, mask. Um, I've had many um, encounters where they were not able to understand me. And so I just I just have to stop mm -hmm. and breathe and then just speak a little bit louder. Mm -hmm. But this new normal, we don't know how long we will mm -hmm. be in it, but we have we have to adapt and mm -hmm. there are a lot of re um, re sources out there like you and like many others who just reach out, just reach out. Mm -hmm. We will get through this. We, we will. Yeah, there are masks with clear mouth openings so that the mouth can be seen a little bit better. Some businesses oh, yes. are allowing those facial shields. So let's pretend your kid's going back to, to in-person teaching and he has a significant stutter. Talk with the faculty at the school and see what accommodations can be made so you can see his face. You protect everyone, you do the distancing, everything we know we're supposed to do, and let the child's face be seen in this time period or going into public. And um, they've got some pretty good, pretty good products available so that the person who stutters mouth can be seen. It go, I think it's going to go, it goes a long way. We also have children who don't have the funds or school systems that don't have the funds to provide these for children. But right. um, I mean, r right now they are, making those 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 masks that have the Ooh. clear that will be even more helpful f for us yes and they're becoming more affordable exactly yeah exactly so, but anyways. so 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what advice would you give t- to another person who stutters? It depends. Remember, I'm an, I, I'm an SLP who treats stuttering times 28 years, and it depends. A couple golden nuggets. One is... Do work to reduce how much you project thoughts about stuttering on others. It's true that some people couldn't watch the king's speech, even though Firth was faking a stutter. There were people who could not watch him stutter. There are people that are unable or unwilling to go to a support group for people who stutter. I know because I've suggested people do it and some people just weren't ready. If you stutter and you're unable to watch someone else stutter, that means you are you project inner thoughts and feelings through someone else who stutters. So that's an indicator for some work that you might want to do. Um, golden nugget two is to to disclose. Go ahead and tell people you stutter. Tim and Pedro have told you that all the way through high school and further. We tried our very best to conceal it. It doesn't work. And you cannot have harmony within yourself by having this Hyde and Jekyll thing, the split personality. Everyone knows you stutter. You know you stutter. You try to portray yourself as someone who doesn't stutter. So go ahead and tell people, take chances, be brave. And then depending on... we're also talking about different age groups and severities and whatnot. But I tell you what, I've had the pleasure of helping first responders who stutter, firefighters, a pilot at the Air Force Academy, a kid going off to West Point, preachers, pastors, priests, um, attorneys, kids going to law school, going to medical school, nursing school. I absolutely love helping people who want to go into a career to help other people and stuttering seems to be the thing that might hold them back. Chase your dream and there's help out there on the way. How cool. I mean, whoo, uh, that's so, that's just so powerful. So if, if you had the opportunity to be on the world stage and tell the world, give the world some insight um, as to what stuttering is. What message would you convey to the world? What a plump, juicy question, Pedro. Why, thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah. I would stand there. So let's pretend I'm in a stadium. I'm at the Mercedes-Benz here in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's 73,000 people for a soccer match. And I'm down in the field on the podium with a microphone. I'd say, this is what I, <laughs> this is what I want you to know about stuttering. You know, stuttering is more than a speech impediment, the flow of speech. It can be humiliating and embarrassing for people. People can develop fear and avoidance. Speech is oftentimes your first impression, right? So going up and asking someone a question or saying your name, things that everyone else seems to take for granted is difficult for us. And so please understand that stuttering is very difficult for people who stutter. Never make fun, bully, tease allow us to finish our words. It's okay to ask us what it's like to stutter and support us and tell everyone else that, that you that you bump into to be patient with, with people who stutter, never mimic, never tease. That's an awesome message. And so, Tim, I, I can't believe that we have been talking for over an hour and a half. Ooh, it has ooh. been fan. Fantastic. I have thoroughly you, Pedro. thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. And and so I wanted to to just say thank you f- for spending your um, um evening w- with me sh- sh- sharing your story because I believe there's healing in sh- sharing. And so you are 
hashtag awesome, hashtag courageous. You are just outstanding. And so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being on this podcast. Well, how kind. And I look forward to digging into your in, into your website and hearing some more of your podcasts. And, and we're all glad that you at age 40 said, I'm going to take this thing on and here you are doing, doing podcasts, sharing, sharing good work. Thank you, sir. Now I have awesome listeners and they are global. What if they wanted to reach out to you? How would they do that? Okay. So my podcasts are accessible on most of the platforms. It's Stuttering Solutions Atlanta. It's on Spotify and Pandora and, and Google, Apple, I guess. But um, so I'm a, I'm a noob to podcasts. However, um, many of mine are inform about things like breathing, eye contact aversion, fear, anxiety, how memories of stuttering interact. So I like to, I like to teach about stuttering. And then I also have some really good in, in, interviews with people. My website is stuttering-specialist.com. Last but not least, I have a nonprofit called Raise Your Voice Incorporated. And within the self-help, or sorry, within the nonprofit community, there's different slices of the pie you have some of the bigger nonprofits doing big conferences and so forth and so on. What I did in 2019 is I, I educated free of charge 1,000 speech pathologists, and they were able to get CEUs for licensing. That was just 2019 alone. 2018 was just shy of that. My way of giving back is to try to teach as many speech pathologists as possible the inner workings of stuttering that you have shared with us tonight, Pedro, and for parents and teachers to better understand that quiet kid in the class, there might be a lot more going on than, than meets the eye. And it's become more difficult to find a specialist in stuttering for many reasons that we don't have time to go into. But if there's a kid who stutters that shows up on the caseload at school or in a clinic, you know, any way that I can help for that, for that speech pathologist to know a little bit more about stuttering, if somehow they saw me on the web or in a podcast or in-person teaching, that's how I'm giving back when I'm not, when I'm not one-to-one -one with a patient. Oh, how cool, sir. We will have all those links on the on the podcast notes that way um anyone from mm. around the globe can have access so that is that's just awesome wonderful um so once again i want to say thank you thank you thank you i hope this is not our last conversation because oh while you were talking i was taking down notes like a lot of notes and so i'm thinking <laughs> down the road <laughs> Let us continue this awesome conversation because you are a beacon of light in our community. And so I just, I just, I, I want to just thank you for that. Well, that is very, very kind of you, Pedro. And I, and I w wish you well. I know that you guys just had storms, ma major storms coming up through where you live. You had Sally. Everyone heard about Sally? We had Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Marco, Gamma, and then yeah. there's a brand new one, Delta, that has just Jeez. formed in the Gulf. So, so. <laughs> I may pack my bags again. So it's yeah. <laughs> it's what happens when you when you know you live by the water here in Texas. So well, I'm 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 in Atlanta. If you need to sprint out of there, okay. All right, sir. Thank you so much. You take care. Be well and stay safe. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, sir. If you like this podcast, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Subscribe, rate, and review. Thank you for listening, and we will talk again.